كتير ومنسقين معارف في التيب مودل رح يتحدثوا عن دور المتاحف في عصرنا هذا على اساس تطور الفن المعاصر على مبدا تجمع وتواصل بينما في الماضي كان المبدا فرق واسطه فخلينا نستمع لهم واسئلتكم بعدين لاحقا تكون مختصره ومترجم حتى بالعربي ومترجم لكم اياها. Good evening. On behalf of all, I welcome uh, Chris Derfin, director of the Tate uh, Modern. Uh, this is uh, not your first visit to Jordan and to Dara Tufinun, and I hope it will not be your last, <laughs> even after you uh, move to Berlin to have a, a prestigious uh, avant-garde uh, folk schooling. Folk schooling, this is how you pronounce it. Theater. It's theater. Yes. This is not our first meeting uh, with, uh, with Tate. Uh, we had an exchange back in 2011 with the Out of Place exhibition uh, that was shown in London and uh, in, uh, in Amman. We are looking forward to more, towards more initiative and exchange and collaboration together. We are eager to hear you reflect on the future of museums. On the, on the future of museums. Uh, the, the, art, the contemporary art of today is based on the principle of uh, uh, group and connect, uh, uh, combine and connect, which was different from before when it used to be uh, the last century separate and uh, shop. It's private museums, which are proliferating now everywhere. Will it be a ruination? or uh, as you wrote in your article, Indiana Jones and the Ruins of the Private Museum. Uh, uh, thank God, we are known is not a museum. We are a home for the art. Uh, for 28 years now, we have been, our mission has been to be a haven for artists, for uh, the audience, where knowledge, uh, creativity, and uh, dialogue prevails. We believe strongly in the importance of the support for the arts in conflict zones. Did we succeed? Can we succeed in, in this situation in, uh, with all these wars that we are facing and this terrible turmoil in our region where people are struggling to survive and to be free? Only time will tell. Uh, last but not least, I welcome uh, Vasili Okumlopoulos, who <laughs> <Very> is <good. laughs> <laughs> assistant curator uh, for the international collection at the Tate, and Karen Greenberg. I don't know if she's, uh, she can hear. And uh, Vasily. She, she's is here, but here. she's looking like you all should do at your fantastic show. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Vasily will be in conversation with Chris. So welcome to you all and thank you for coming to us. Thank you, Sua. Uh, both Vasilis, we have some reverb, but Yernan is here, okay? Um, thank you, Sua. Vasilis Oikonopoulos, Sua is pronouncing the name much better than I am, <laughs> and Karen Greenberg, we can only feel incredibly privileged and honored to be able to be here at Dalat al -Fanur. And when you look and stare and meditate at this image, it's, it's quite a special occasion because five years ago, in 2011, we were presenting here together with Dalat al -Fanur, the exhibition Out of Place. And to your right, there was the work of an artist who is also in this fantastic exhibition, A Life in the Dead Sea, of Hayrir Sarkisian, who is Syrian-Armenian. And to your left was the work of an artist who is here as well, Alam Shibli, Darat al fanun exploring the difference, the tension between what is the Arab political identity and what is Arab cultural identity, 
and it's an extremely important subject, not only for the Middle East, but also for London, for Paris, France, for Belgium, where I come from, and for Germany. And now you also understand my thick German accent, no? <laughs> combination of Belgium and German. But we always can come back here, not in the least also thanks to this fantastic family, and I would like to thank His Majesty the Prince Raad, Alusain and Princess Majda, and also Prince Miret, because what you have been doing for us, preparing together with Sua and the students of Faranis Azait, two of them I see sitting here on the second and the third row, we have been preparing the terrain, and we are incredibly lucky to be able, thanks to your family, uh, Prince Raad, to be able to present Faranis Azait at Tate Modern in June 2017, an exhibition which is going to travel to Berlin. And Vasilis will explain in a short while why we want to do the exhibition Faranis Azait. But let's start with something else. So when you look at this picture, you feel immediately out of place, because this is the very room where we did out of place with practically the same artist, but with different work. And this is the work of a Romanian artist, Ion Grigorescu, which was shown on the spot where Sua is presenting, very rarely that she's presenting her own work, which is about the growth, the, the fruit, the tree growth of your parents, which was demolished eight times by the Israeli occupation, and about 26,893 roots, uh, trees got uprooted by the army. And I think beyond these figures, it says also that we can be out of place immediately. Something can happen overnight and then it's gone. And that's the reason why a museum is so important, because in a museum, the difference between a museum, I think, and a place where artworks come and go is that in a museum you can revisit all the time works. And this is, for instance, a work which is incredibly important because it's the work by an older photographer, Ursula schulz Dombrook, and she has been photographing in 2003 the train stations of the Hejaz Railway in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And of course, when you see these photographs, you immediately think of whom? You immediately think of the pioneers of German photography, Bernd and Hila Becher, and you know that Shirin and uh, Ahmed Abu Ghazale, they have in their collection the work of Bernd and Hila Becher. And actually, she was very close to Bernd and Hila Becher. And the, the artist has been always photographing these lost places, places which are out of place. But in a museum, you can revisit these photographs. And what you see then is sometimes a completely different context. Because presenting these photographs today, in a world which is, in a geopolitical sense, always changing. We don't know anymore what the borders are. They are definitely not porous, but what is still a border? The border is always changing. And today, this morning, when Vasilis and I, we visited Zatari, Camp Zatari, which we feel as a very important experience for our work in dealing with culture and the distribution of culture, we felt that same feeling, what is a border today? Is there still a border between Jordan and Syria? And if there is still a border, how would we define that border? Of course, that border is completely different from the border pictures and the railway pictures of Ursula schulz domburg So we have to project our own ideas on these works of art and in a museum you can always go, come back, and these works will always be and have a different context. When we see the works here of Nablus, these works here to your left front, they were censored in Paris at the time of the exhibition at the Jeu de Pont because the French press, and not only the conservative press, but also the progressive press, said these are commemorations, celebrations of martyrs. But when we see these pictures in the situation of today, we see something different. We see families who are about to be refugees again. And they like to stick 
and they want to create still a piece of identity. And that's what we felt today at Camp Zatari when the function of culture is to give people a sense of place and a sense of identity. And we were very nervous, Vasilis and I, going there because we thought, hmm, how are we going to react? But we were incredibly optimistic after visiting the camp because we feel that slowly there is going to be a sense of place in which we all have to invest together. And we know by now that people, after two years in the refugee camp, think about the 48 experience, about the 60s experience, think about the Turkish experience, that people after two years, they will make up their mind if they want to stay somewhere else, if they have to stay somewhere else. And we also learn from the experience of Jordan and also Lebanon that after 17 years, people will stay where they travel to. Me, Bertolt Brecht and Heinrich Müller, and I decided to invest my time as the artistic director of the Volksbühne in Berlin in this new refugee camp, the Zatari camp of Berlin, which is now Tempelhof city with about 14,000 refugees, which is of course a luxury situation compared to the 138,000 in Camp Zatari. But we immediately had the idea this morning that we have to create a network of refugee cities, that we can invest both in attending, in giving a sense of place to refugee cities, and maybe we can talk about it later. But we are here to celebrate Faramisa Zayt, an artist who went and moved from place to place, and an artist who took on several identities at the same time. She is an international artist with multiple identities, and when you look at the old films, I mean, sometimes you see Faramisa as a Turkish artist, then again she is a British artist. And then again, she is a Paris artist. And then again, she is a Jordan artist. And I don't think that's a problem. I think that today, to have these multiple identities and to be able to play them out is incredibly important. I think it's interesting because you already provided a lot of um, uh, thoughts and ideas about why Farlisa is interesting. First of all, she crossed all those borders. She crossed all those boundaries that were, at the time, you know, like uh, when national borders and boundaries were quite, you know, stable and uh, necessary to a certain extent. Farinlisa was described a very kind of like cosmopolitan and international trajectory. Uh, sometimes in the best possible conditions, sometimes through a very difficult situation, very challenging moments. And she kind of like, she was an artist who, beyond all the difficulties that life brought to her, she perse persevered and she continued to be practicing a really spectacular, but also really kind of a, um, unique, very, very particular, very idiosyncratic language of abstraction, and not only, but also portraiture and figuration. Um, and there's not many female practitioners of that period that were really took on all those challenges and responded to the way that the world was functioning at that time, but also to the way that abstraction uh, is not a singular language that was developed in the kind of like the Western capitals and then kind of like became a common language throughout, but it was a language that developed by a number of artists who were bringing into it their own experiences and their own uh, personal histories. And that's what is important about Farnese, that she brought a number of histories to the history of abstraction. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that the, the, uh, I believe that the Tate exhibition will really bring forward all those histories which also go beyond the history of abstraction. Uh, it's interesting, for example, that Farnese began as a figurative artist, uh, moved to abstract to abstraction, then she returns to figuration at a later stage in her life. But the, 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 the transition in all those steps, uh, there's a kind of like, it's a very common, the commonalities that she continues bringing forward and refining, even to when she returns to, to, up to figuration. Her figuration is a, is a, has a strong abstract element, which becomes kind of like a, a, a you know, a, a proto kind of like, you know, in, including a, a number of, of, of ideas which are coming from her intensity, his, her exploration about um, the line, shapes, forms, colors, but also the psychological effects 
of uh, painting, um, which is truly remarkable. We will report back to you. And Faranis Azad is part of an exhibition series mm -hmm. which started with artists from Lebanon like Salou and Aoudou Shouker. And you see immediately what the ideas of Tate. So we don't want to make a difference between the so-called blockbuster exhibitions with big names and the so-called niche exhibitions with lesser known names. And I think that's a lesson we learned in the museum world of the past five, six, seven years only that we have to show the courage to explore and to show that which we don't know and yet. Just to add to what you say, the, the exhibition of Salor Arabiosikere was uh, the only exhibition that was extended by three months in Tate Modern because of the popularity of the show. It exceeded every expectation. It doubled the amount of visitors that we, that we expected to have. And that also signifies the, signifies the fact that the audience is keen to explore new dimensions in the kind of like the, 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 the art historical understandings. And in the audience, these boundaries and borders have already been broken. So it's about time for the museum to, to follow somehow and to break the, sa the same boundaries that the, the audiences are already com uh, understanding. In the museum world, we say we don't want to follow the given and received canons anymore. I think we, there are many different stories to be explored today. One of these stories we explored was the work of the Sudanese artist who went into exile in Qatar and is now living in Oxford, Ibrahim El Salahi. And i just show you how he did it. This is Ibrahim El Salahi living in Oxford. He came from Sudan, he went in exile to Qatar. This is the painting which we acquired, which we restored, which we stabilized because it's normal. I mean, if you know the history of African modern and contemporary art, because of the climatological and material conditions, these works are not always in the same condition as, let's say, Picasso or Gerhard Richter. And I don't think that should be a problem. Too many times in the museum world we say, oh, there is a hole in the painting, we are not going to touch it. I still remember when I did the Brazilian artist Helio Tisica in 1987 from Brazil, that at suddenly at a very famous New York gallery who wanted to show this work, I was called by the famous gallery dealer, I'm not calling names, and she called me in the middle of the night and she said, there are some little flies in the paper. We have to evacuate the paper. And I thought, that's an interesting case of anthropophagia, <laughs> of eating the West, you know, and doing the West and the Western canon again and again, and reformulate it. So, in the case of Ibrahim and Salai, we had to work on the material conditions, and look what we did, my goodness, that's dangerous, mm. to present the Sudanese painting of the 60s next to a Picasso. The story goes even further. We know that MoMA bought in the 60s two or three Ibrahim and Salahis mm. in one of the Pan-African exhibitions. But when we asked our colleagues, in MoMA, where are these? They don't. They didn't know. And we are also now trying to find back a work of Faram Lisa Zeit, which was given to a famous museum in Germany, and they are trying to locate it. So the fantastic thing is that we started this lecture of out of place. Some of these works didn't have a place, and we want to give them a place even if we have to find them back, because they deserve a place next to Picasso. This is the situation like it was three years ago before we bought the Ibrahim El Salahi and the rehang with our curators Karen Greenberg and Vasilis Oikonopoulos under the guidance of the new director of Tate Modern, Frances Morris, and you will meet her at the end of our lecture, we decided to start rehanging works and retelling the story, the history of modern art. And suddenly you find Ibrahim and Salahi in a completely different context, different to the one context where we have seen always the work of the West and the work of the East. To give you another example, this is a famous work by the American artist, an anti-Vietnam War work by Leon Golub. One of our most popular rooms, you remember Vasilis, 
was when we combined this work of 1973, Vietnam, together with the Guernica of the Middle East. And we fought very hard between the Guggenheim and us to get that work. And we combined in the same room, Golub, with the work of Dia al Azawi, Sabra and Shatila massacre. And this room was one of the Most best attended, attended rooms. rooms. Do you remember what happened? I mean, the discussions, because you guys were discussing it, if we should do it at all, no? The, the room, you mean, if we yeah. should do that. The, it was um, one of the most visited rooms in Tate Modern that we ever put together. Uh, people were queuing outside the room to enter this room, and it's the, the, the complexity of placing two works together that uh, are talking about the trauma of war, about the condition of, uh, of um, um, you know, destruction and uh, killings is just produces such a passionate reaction by the audience, but also produces a kind of like a, a new kind of like um, a portal to historical events that otherwise remain unknown. And not so many people knew about Sabra and Satila massacre in the UK, but then it became a, 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 a point of discussion in entered dialogue in, in, the, uh, in London. This is quite important. And of course, today the museum is, I think, overwhelmed by this idea of out of place. <coughs> A very famous German artist, Wolfgang Tillmans, was going to have an exhibition at Tate Modern in February 2017. He wrote to me an email on September 5, 2017, and he's a photographer, and he sent me the following email. He said, amazing, I mean, I cannot beat these kind of images. The first refugees arrived from Hungary after Austria and Germany opened borders. And Wolfgang Tillmans decided to concentrate himself in the weeks after September 5 on this theme, how are these refugee flows being photographed in Europe? One of the things which we wondered about is that we know that these people keep walking also at night. I'm showing this because this is one of my new venues in Berlin. This is the old airport, you remember Kennedy? Ich bin ein Berliner. That's the airport which was uh, designed in the 20s by Ernst Sagri and then it was used by the Nazis as the official airport of Nazi Germany and then of course it was used after that as the free airport, the airport of the Allies, Ich bin ein Berliner by the American allies. This airport is empty and in this airport we have seven, sorry, eight hangars, turbine halls like of Tate Modern and now in this airport are living in a much worse situation than Camp Zatari, much less organized. Of course not overwhelmed by too many NGOs. They are living now 14,000 refugees and we call it refugee city. What we don't want, these are the showers and the showers were rejected by the refugees because these are not apt to how they think a shower and a toilet should be. We have to learn about these things mm -hmm. but we have to adapt this refugee city. One of the big problems we are faced is fake families. You know that a lot of women and children get out of Syria via Turkey and to Greece and they are on demand of the family being chaperoned by young men who guide them through all these countries. And these young men arrive as a family with these families in Tempelhof and one of the things is to think in Tempelhof what is a family. Mm. So immediately this whole idea of giving structure is not just only about ordering beds but it's only about also about the construction of a family and we do believe that education, labor, cultural activities are incredibly important in this situation. What can art do? Mm. I'm sorry for some of my fellow travelers and fellow curators to be poetic mm. and to create small pleasures in order to <coughs> correct great tragedies, which was the theme of the last Istanbul Biennial, is not working anymore. Mm. We cannot console, we cannot 
heal these situations by little poems. And by little poems it's saying, you know, let's look at art, it's not enough. We have to be much more ambitious than just to design gardens in the midst of a war. We also cannot solve these situations by building these kind of big museums with the champagne tower and the truffle depository and the billionaire suit. These kind of situations to say maybe a little poem can help us, can heal can improve the situation, or to say, let's build the big museum in Abu Dhabi, is not going to help anymore. We have therefore to reinvent the function of art and even to reinvent the function of the museum. I think that the area of the big, big, big museum is almost, has almost ended. We have to be more humble. We have to learn from the experience of Darat al Fanun about what architecture of art space is new. And I'm not, I'm not saying that because I'm here. I keep saying that in architectural conferences in Europe, and I'm not mentioning you alone, mm -hmm. don't think so. We have to learn from the experiences of Sharjah in the Gulf. Yeah. We can learn from other experiences as well. For instance, we can learn from the experience of Dayanita Singh. Dayanita Singh is an Indian photographer, artist, and she created her little museum. Mm. This is her museum. Mm. It's a little museum full of her photographs which she installs over and over and over again in different situations. So this is the extension of the art gallery as we know it. Of course it's a caricature and this is maybe an other future of the museum. A book museum maybe. Something else. Something maybe which is an atlas. This atlas was designed by the Design Academy in Eindhoven and it's called the Subjective Atlas of Palestina by the fabled Dutch typographer, graphic designer, Annelies de Bet. The Subjective Atlas of Palestina is also a museum. It's an archival record. And this is an example of a very humble museum in Naoshima on an island in Japan created by Benesse, Benessere, it means well-being, he's the guy who owns this translation company, and he ordered artists, commissioned artists like Renato, to <coughs> buy old houses of people in order to help them to survive economically and then turn these houses into little museums. Vasilis, you and I, we both worked for one of the greatest visionary architects in the world, both in Rotterdam, and Fadiz and I, we work both for OMA, Office for Metropolitan Architecture, for Rem Kolhas. What did you learn about this whole idea of transforming the museum? Um, I think the most, important, the most important aspect of transforming a museum is basically to start by undoing the notion of the museum. And you can undo the notion of the museum by rethinking what a museum can do. <coughs> and it's interesting because you spoke about the, uh, the photograph by Wolfgang and the, uh, the, the conversation you had between the two of you. And it seems to me that the, uh, the museum and is more of a museum of flows, more a museum of um, physical, physical movement, uh, more a museum of uh, performance. A space and a place that performs, it can exist and it cannot exist, it can be ephemeral, it can be dispersed, it can be here and there, but it can also be about real production of culture. And uh, I think this is the, um, the, the importance of thinking how to rethink the, the museum structure or the museum as, a, as an infrastructure. Um, it's a more of a, an urban model. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we saw that today in uh, Zatari, the intense urbanization of a space which was meant to be ephemeral, was meant to be for a very short period of time. But also the, um, the um, extreme intensity and excitement of producing culture, similarities to a previous culture, but also the kind of like the optimism that you mentioned, is the possibility of a new culture as well. And I think that's kind of like, these are really two important aspects or facets that do not really translate in the Tempelhof uh, model when you kind of like present with the generic, when you are entering the generic, you are becoming a more like a boxed 
kind of like um, uh, object or subject. I think um, one of the, 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 the most important trends in terms of rethinking the museum is to listen very carefully what it means to reinvent an art school. And what we see today is that many new initiatives, they're exploring a new type of art school. And these art schools are reinvented, not just by theoreticians or pedagogues, but often they are reinvented by artists themselves. And when you look at the world of art, happening right now we see a lot of artists working in groups and collectives. And these collectives don't make a difference between the production of artworks and the production of discourse and the production of pedagogy. So what I would like to plead for is listen very carefully to what's happening in Sharjah, what's happening in several places in West Africa, is that a new type of cultural foundation, a new type of a private museum, because there are many regions in the world where we cannot count on the state and we have to do it ourselves. That we have to always try to think also what is the learning component and not the learning component so much in trying to explain these images but also the learning component is what does it mean to decide to make a work which is visual production. Only later comes the word art. And I still remember working for Mitterrand in the 80s where our commission was to reinvent a new type of art school where we decided to propose a plan which was of course immediately rejected by the Ministry of Education is to say a new art school type is where we the first and the second year we allow everybody to come. Young, old, specialist, good, bad in order to make, to learn to make decisions. Mm -hmm. The decision namely to make something which you want to offer to the world. And I think one of the most exciting university research departments is now at Harvard, which is the laboratory for research of decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. I think today to learn to make a good decision is one of the most important aspects. And you know, we already found out in uh, neuro science and neurology that in order to make a good decision you have to learn how to forget mm. which is I think very important also for this region in order to make a good decision you we have to be able to learn again how to forget imagine imagine that we cannot forget that all these divorces would end up in a barbaric war right Okay, so we have to learn how to forget and in order to forget we can learn again how to remember. Don't forget that Marcel Proust, that he wrote already, that forgetting is the beginning of remembering. Without forgetting there is no remembering and I think it's a lesson we can learn which is this whole element of reconciliation. And reconciliation is incredibly important when we think in terms of culture. So that's what new schools could look for. And you see it everywhere. In London you have exhibitions of international artists who are proposing designs for new schools. Indeed, the time of the incredible growing art museum is over. Mm. Vasilis, do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think the... Um, the time of an incredibly growing art museum is not necessarily over. The model of the museum as, see, a, physical, as, a, physical as a physical space that grows probably over. Because the museum has the capacity to grow inside you and you take parts of the museum with you. If, if, no matter if you're visiting New York, London, Sarza, uh, Amman, wherever throughout the world you take parts of the museum with you. You also take parts of the city where this museum exists with you. You also take parts of the people that you encountered with you. And that's what kind of like creates the, the, the ever-going museum, the ever-growing museum, which again, it will, it will create a new model about understanding and about dialogue and about coexistence. And that incredible growing art museum, which is constantly developing, is becoming something completely different. This is a cover of a very well-read art magazine called Art News. And it was published in 2001. Now look 
14 years later, The Economist, which is a very important American econ economical magazine, they presented a special report on museums called Temples of Delight. And when I opened it, I was thinking, oh, again, they write about architecture, iconic architecture, and you know, all these steps which we have to climb, and then you see all these big, wide rooms, and we have to be very respectful and to admire the genius of the art and the artist. No, they were using a picture of Tate Modern. Mm -hmm. And the Temple of Delight was on a wing and a prayer, and what they meant was that the museum was now suddenly considering the public, the audience, not as a hindrance anymore. Mm. I remember working in the Netherlands in the 80s, where very famous and very powerful art directors were always telling us young curators the biggest problem of the museum is the public. Mm. It would be much better to have empty museums, mm. only with art. Now, The Economist was showing this picture and it was so strange, Sir Nicholas Sorota, our boss and the, the one who conceived Tate Modern in 2000 and conceived the new Tate Modern opening in June 2016, he was saying in 2003 something happened at Tate, something very strange at this big hall, the Turbine Hall. They presented in Tate, I was not there yet, they presented the work, the weather project by an artist from Denmark, Olafar Eliasson, who lives like all the artists in the world in Berlin right now. Because Berlin is cheap. <laughs> and he presented his work, this artificial sun. And the artists and the curators, they were, and the, 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 the management team, they were completely confused. Because not only we had never built Tate for more than 1.8 million people, suddenly Hundreds of thousands of people flocked into the turbine hall to do whatever they wanted, to hang out, to create picnics, to have a kindergarten, to make happenings, to, uh, to, to say we want to have a sleep in. Everything which had in the first place nothing to do with the weather project. And after a couple of weeks, Nick Sorota and the artist and the team said there is no solution because there is no problem. The public wants to decide for themselves. And that was one of the campaign ideas for the architects of Tate Modern. We're going to make a museum whereby the public is not a hindrance anymore. And that's what we are now working on in terms of the future of Tate Modern. It's going to be a museum which is going to be like an urban plaza. It's going to be like an agora. It's going to be like an urban place. And you know, public places in London get more and more difficult because London becomes a privatized city. So we decided to make a museum which is reflecting on that idea of an agora, of a public space. And when they present the drawings, you feel that they almost present it like a city in a city. And I still remember when we discussed these initial plans, that some, I'm not saying you, that some of the curators, they looked like, and some of the newspapers they wrote, this art will be squeezed out of Tate Modern, there will be more space for the public than for the artworks. What was your reaction? Um, that's the excitement that there's going to be more and more people coming to experience the museum, not necessarily as a kind of like looking at the objects, but experiencing the experience of the other as well. And that's kind of like what we will do with the Tate Exchange, uh, bring new educational programs transform the way museum functions as an educational machine, uh, transform the way that people approach art history and transform and shift understandings about what it means to be uh, existing within an environment, what it means to be learning and what it means to be knowing more and more about uh, the development of, yeah. Uh, you remember when we presented this? Yeah. We didn't believe it. I mean, <laughs> Look, this is spiritual inspiration. The public said, yes, of course, <laughs> but only 11%. Mm. Emotional, aesthetic experience, yes, of course, but only 14%. Intellectual knowledge, of course, 29%. And then social, I like to come to Tate because I want to spend time with others, 45%. The architects, everybody was like, oh my God. 
How does a museum look like? What is the architecture for such a museum? What is then going to be the type of art we present when people say, I like to come to a museum because I would like to spend time with others, just like a Dallas Alpha note. Yeah. <laughs> you know that Woody Allen when said, Woody Allen, the filmmaker, that the museum was the best place in the world for dating. <laughs> and when you look at the films of Woody Allen and also That's other films, Antonioni and the Nouvelle Vague, in mm -hmm. the museum, you always date. And the museum is the only place in the world where you are allowed to watch people watching. Can you imagine in the subway, hanging over Prince Ram's shoulder and reading <laughs> the newspapers he's reading or pretends to read? You immediately get arrested, not because it's Prince Ram, but the one who watches the watcher is a voyeur. In a museum, you're allowed to be a voyeur. Also in a museum, you're allowed to ask questions which even Google can't answer. Mm. When we presented this as a possible slogan, Eric Schmidt, the billionaire, owner, CEO of Google, he was very jealous. <laughs> we are presenting questions Google can't answer. And the most important are not the answers. But the most important are coming up with the questions the museum can ask, not should ask, but can ask. And that's what art is for. I was visiting today the, a private collection in, in, in uh, Amman. And these fabulous collectors asked me completely an improvised by improvisation that I should react to the works of art they had. I was invited to explain them to uh, politicians and also to ambassadors. And I got so nervous, so I decided just to say whatever I felt at that moment. And it was all kinds of things which, when you want to verify what I said, you will not find any verification on Google. Nothing. Not because nothing was true, what I was saying, but I was posing the questions and giving the answers in a completely different way than ever Google would do it. So, what are the vital experiments in an age of austerity? What is growth? What are contemporary rites of passage? What is the capacity of art? What makes you change your mind? What is better forgotten? When you ask these questions of Google tonight, on your tablet, on your computer, what is better forgotten? I mean, I don't know what the machine is going to say. I tried once, what is the capacity of art? And you know what the first thing was I got? Mm. Google gave me an algorithm which led me to the following term, Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, I have to be smart. Mm. I have to be smart. If Google says, what is the capacity of art Antarctica, then I have to start to understand these algorithms and maybe I can break in, I can hack a little bit of reality. And that's very interesting that a museum is hacking a little bit of reality. A museum is giving you this sense of what we call serendipity, which is you always find what you're not looking for. And that's exactly what I found in this exhibition, A Life in the Dead Sea, because I am interested in Muniz Anasa's book, Alive in the Dead Sea. And I was interested in this whole tension which the book is promising us between what's the difference between Arab cultural and Arab political identity. Of course I'm not going to find the answers here, mm. but I find different questions and therefore different answers. And this is what art can do. The future museum, ladies and gentlemen, this is what it's going to be. A blurred distinction between producers and receivers. Culture is massively produced. Culture becomes increasingly a precondition of all kinds of economical value systems. Culture is entrenched in the fabric of daily life. And culture will depend less on buildings in one place as in organization models. That's for true. That's the PowerPoint presentation. Boston Consultancy. McKinsey. <laughs> That's what you pay thousands of dollars for. But we have to do it ourselves. We have to reinvent the future of museums. And it doesn't matter if they are big or small. It doesn't matter if they are private or public. We have to accept that there is a complete blur and that we have to reinvent the museum because sadly enough, since the invention of the museum, think about the British Museum or the National Gallery, Altus Museum in Berlin, we didn't 
much reinvent the museum, and now it's high time. But when we asked them questions, they couldn't fully answer them as well. So in a way, a museum is a much more democratic form of representation than any government, inclusive the government of Jordan. Mm -hmm. What is the future of the museum, Vasilis? Mm. Wow, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you a hint for this participation. Uh, uh, Come on. Uh, the future of the museum is probably um, translating everything that you see into something that you then poses a question to yourself and poses a question to others. And, um, and that's you know, the, the kind of like uh, what Tate is trying to do specifically with the, um, uh, the, 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 the new programs and the new spaces that we're developing is allow a kind of like interaction between people to, to, to gain central states onto the kind of like the, the, the museum uh, program and the exhibition program. Um, and also to, I like the idea of like hacking into reality and I think the, the, uh, the exhibitions as well as the other program, parallel programs around the museum are hacking into what has been dominant up until now and uh, for example to return a little bit to the uh, Final Lissazade exhibition I see the Final Lissazade exhibition now as a, a, a little hack into the kind of like the, 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 the mainstream the kind of like the, the, uh, the um, canonical history of uh, 20th century art history. So I think that's, that's quite, quite important. Darat al Fanun, the next exhibition is going to be the so-called Arab version of Do It. And Do It is an exhibition which was developed by our esteemed colleague Hans Ulrich Obrist in Europe in the first place. And Do It mm. is a project whereby artists have been asked what is the kind of project you would like to do and what is the kind of project you would like to offer to the public in order to make it themselves, to do it. And it's very beautiful in Arab. You, you told me in Arab, what is it again in Arab, do it? Do it, Belarabi. Belarabi, Bel not bad, huh? And so Belarabi will come from Sharjah to Amman, Jordan. And Belarabi, do it, is a form of participation which is not based on belittling. It's not like here I am and you are there. It's, a, it's a, a kind of establishing a dialogue and that's incredibly important. The European community and the Bologna research, they told us that those countries where cultural participation is the highest, people are more, tend to be, tend to be more happy and more community established than other countries. For the moment, the most unhappiest countries in Europe are in this order Portugal, Spain and Denmark. Not Greece, because in Greece the cultural participation is quite high. And they have another form of viable cultural participation which is not based on money, because you know these rich Greeks, they all live now in London. <laughs> they are refugees, I call them the refugees. So we have new refugees. I mean, London is becoming really a refugee city. And we should feel pity with them because they are out of place as well. We should help them. Anyway, I should not get, I'm always getting very bitter when I speak about this. But cultural participation is incredible form to create this form of happiness. Because cultural participation is about innovation, welfare, sustainability, social cohesion, no entrepreneurship, soft power, local identity, and knowledge economy. And this, you've, you know, you can start to introduce everywhere. I think, for instance, that protest demonstrations, they need style. Mm -hmm. When you protest, then I think you need to make beautiful banners. <laughs> <laughs> and you need a beautiful <coughs> typography. And I learned this from being an assistant to Jean-Luc Godard, the filmmaker, where he said, in order to make a film, you need style. Everything has to look good. So protest should look good. Mm -hmm. This is a form of protest which was staged at Tate by the Cuban artist Tania Bruguera. And we're going to, should I tell you? Yes. We're going to restage it again at the opening week of the new Tate model in June to professional professional, no actors, professional police horsemen, they're coming into the turbine hall and they teach people how to stand in line. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, yeah. 
<laughs> now, people, they are just like during the Venom project, they start to appropriate artworks at Tate because this was the amazing line, the breach in the floor of the turbine wall by Doris Salcedo, and it, the piece was kidnapped by citizens protesting for living wage campaign. And it was an amazing, beautiful form of protest. And it got the news because it had style. So when you protest, you need to you have, have to have style. Be well dressed, okay? <laughs> Hoodies don't work. Remember that, that's not cool anymore. <laughs> so we protested for IWB, release IWB, and it created a kind of friction because it was a very potent form of protest. In Tate, we always have to negotiate between a protest and between an happening, between a protest against Tate and a protest which is independent from Tate. And in Birmingham last weekend, they have the right to do so, but they should be also courageous and to say, we are racists. So when you do that, then at least be courageous and say, I have the right to do so because I'm a racist, okay? So we have to learn to listen to a kind of new language, which is incredibly important. And then the exchange, we are going to give one to two floors to a new form of a museum called Tate Exchange, is giving a floor to these kind of conversations, to create a, a common space, to engender a deeper relations with art, to ask these questions, to raise these questions and try to formulate answers and to give open and accessible cultural education opportunities and to give artists an opportunity to contribute ideas by producing a new form of platform, a new form of displaying their work. And I think you, the curators, you are extremely engaged by data exchange, no? Absolutely. It's um, um, a lot of the kind of like the, the mission that we have and the goals that we have for data exchange and for the new kind of like uh, shape of the museum in the future is to feed as more knowledge, as more ideas, as more thinking, as, a, as more concepts as possible to generate as more new processes and new types of engagement. Uh, but I have a question for you because you, you, you spoke so, so much about this kind of like the, uh, the new types of production, the new types of practices that are emerging um, and um, kind of like thinking of the, you know, the, also the linguistic kind of like parameters and the, the use of language and um, I'm just kind of thinking like um, is it necessary to invent a new language? Yes, it is. In order to kind of like to, yes. to describe these new, these new moments, these yeah. new modes of, of, of existing or pro producing and thinking? Yes, because we have to invent in our lives of today new forms of rituals. Mm. And the rituals we know today, of course everybody will say, which is the ritual you would like to achieve the most? And then most of us would say, the ritual of hedge funds. <laughs> Of course, I mean, that's almost ridiculous. The ritual of hedge fund or the ritual of going to the gym in the morning and to look at your stocks at CNN. These are the rituals we know. We have to invent new rituals. And I do think that rituals which are based on exchange, on conversation, on dance, on exploring the body, on theater, to explore and to find a form to observe society within society, that's what theatre is all about. I mean, these kind of new forms, these kind of new rituals we have to explore, and I cannot explain otherwise why Danatal Fanon, Charjan, Tate is doing constantly these kind of performative works of art. Do it is a performative work of art. Is a ritual a form of theatre without the fourth wall between the audience, audiences, different audiences and different producers. I cannot explain otherwise why in Sharjah or in Beirut there are so many cultural spaces which once were called museums who are inviting dancers, who are inviting performers. I cannot explain otherwise this amazing success on the stage and the presence of Walid Raad and Rami Mouret. I cannot explain otherwise the amazing success of the films like Jamana, the, the films of you know, people like well, Schauke, because there is this kind of performative aspect. We don't call it video art anymore, we call it something else. 
It is a ritual, and I think that ritual is a form of negotiation is incredibly important. And we have to learn also, therefore, to make exhibitions in a different way. I think we have to reinvent what the display is of works of art, to hang walls full with whatever, paintings, it's not just enough. We have to be more ambitious. And I think that's something we can learn from the 20s and the 30s, because in the 20s and the 30s, we had these radical museum directors and radical curators and radical architects working together. The strange thing is that this whole idea of conversation and exchange is not just happening in museums. Everywhere we are creating and we are thinking about what is membership tomorrow. Even the Guardian with Alan Rusbridger, you see Alan sitting with the big, thick glasses, and uh, he's now the president of the foundation of the Guardian. Even the Guardian is creating now a theater hub where the news will be presented in a form of a theater. A market where there is a form of transaction to keep the symbolical and the financial value in balance and a form of transaction, which I think is incredibly important, the whole idea of the market. Today the market in Kamsatari is a form of potential economical theater, mm. which is incredible to, in order to establish new structures, that means we need to ritualize. And what is more a perfect ritualization today than a market, than a street? And it's, it does function. And people were not playing shops, but they were creating these functions which we associate with making things, offering things, buying things, transactions. So that was something which, which I thought was incredibly important. Um, the Museum of Tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, is up for grasp. And it's not going to be reinvented by Little Britain, I'm sorry, Great Britain. <laughs> it's not going to be reinvented by Great Britain and the European community. I sometimes wonder if the European community is still a community. And I don't know anymore uh, with um, Sanders or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or whoever that uh, America is going to be look the same as it was for the past 50 years. We will see. But what I do know is that the museum, in all these little spots, gets invented and reinvented and redefined all the time, whether big or small. And that's something I think we learned again, being on this trip and being here with you and listening to you, listening to the makers, listening to the caretakers of art, listening to these visionary people who want to create new cultural foundations, listening to Sua and Darat al -Fanun, and therefore, I would like to invite you, Yerna, now I need your help. Where is Yerna? Yerna? Oh, he's in the back. Uh, therefore, I would like to invite you to listen to the new director of Tate Modern, who is since 30 years at Tate Modern, and she is 57. She is a great defender of women artists. She created the exhibition of Yael Kuzama, Agnes Martin, and many other ones. And she's going to be my successor, and I'm incredibly happy that she presents on video for you, wrapping up the ideas of Vasilis, of Karen, and my ideas, the new Tate Modern. Can you?
That was uh, Francis Moller and Tate Mullen. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you on behalf of my family for allowing my mother to take her place in the center of artistic excellence. I wish uh, she was here with us to have heard your ideas and I think she would have uh, added to what they have said. It's uh, overwhelming. The ideas are overwhelming. I'm sweating. <laughs> As I say these words. Prince Rath is saying that the ideas are overwhelming and that he's sweating. <laughs> <laughs> so I really thank you, sir. And we can do all the best of the success. We will do everything, everything we can from our part to make this exhibition a success. Thank you very much. Thank you. In my mind, in order to anchor myself and be able to follow your discussion, I kept doing the parallel. You speak about the museum and kept stripping off pieces of what we thought are essential in the museum. And I'm thinking of your restaurant, let's see. If you like, I go into a restaurant and I strip out the show of waitering and the presentation of food and the experience of being in a closed space. How much do I have to strip, given the fact that food is inside and outside the restaurants, in our homes, in the public, in the market, everywhere, of course the analogy applies to art. How much do I have to strip before I language becomes meaningless, you know? Restaurants are not, I mean, and what is that essential core, the thing that I still have to maintain to still be able to meaningfully speak about the museum or find a new dictionary category? So we are taking out layers of what is a non-essential museum experience. It's an interesting exercise, it's deconstruction. But, you know, I'm also obsessed with meaningfulness of words. You know, when, when does this exercise stop becoming meaningful? And just give me one item, maybe, rather than telling me what the museum isn't, which I'm very happy to engage in that exercise, what's that essence that has to be there is it the encounter with the object, whether it's within the walls or outside, if I remove the object? Because look, we go to restaurants also to meet people and to see and be seen. But, but so that does, doesn't make the restaurant less about food than, than it is and food not the same. Now I understand what you mean by stripping. I think that the very presence of works of art give the encounters between people meeting each other in these room, in these rooms a completely different character and a completely different way of conversing with each other about art, about the way, about the way we engage ourselves with art and therefore with the world. Mm -hmm. So I do think that, because you sound a little bit like the Daily Telegraph, saying that we squeeze all the art out of tape, not at all, because so many floors which you saw in the images and which when you listen to Francis Morris and when you looked at the video, and when you look at our images, so many surfaces, floors, walls, will be fully tanked with artworks. But what's very important that we want to change the nature of the conversation. Admiration is not enough. Mm. We want to invite you to have a conversation about what it means to introduce El Salahi next to Picasso. Mm. We want to invite you to think about what it means to show Salua Raoul Ashuker along with an exhibition of Roy Lichtenstein. That's incredibly important because that will throw also new ideas about how we see the history, how we see the past, the present and the future of the world. And we can only do that if we provide a museum which is full of questions. And these questions, I think, are posed by works of art. Works of art never give you the full answer. For me, the works here, which I see now, about Nablus, are completely different than when I saw them when they were created. They don't stop asking questions. About what artworks and the encounter with art can do. And, but in reality, it's about bringing more in di dialogues, bringing more artworks, more art forms uh, that cannot be considered even now to be art forms, but in reality, they generate discussions that generate dialogues and they amplify meanings um, indeterminately, without end. 
And I hope we can do that without end, like this kind of like amplifying, bringing in new things, bringing in new dialogues. Get rid of uh, preconceived ideas about art, that is about, for instance, the monetary value of art, which I think is completely uninteresting. Uh, to have preconceived ideas about what is Western and what is Eastern art. Yeah. To have preconceived ideas about the under-recognized artist and the recognized artist. I mean, throw away all these ideas. I can look at any venue and see it as a potential museum from now on. Mm -hmm. I can look at art in any form of expression and, uh, and basically appreciate it in a different light. We are talking about the transformation of the museum and now I would like to know what is your motivation of going into this other kind of institution as a theater? Right, that's a very good question. Uh, Berlin learned a lot from the catastrophe of tourism in Barcelona. And you know that the city of Barcelona is completely ruined by tourism. By the way, all our European cities are ruined by Airbnb and by Uber. Because Uber and Airbnb, they promise us to share in the riches of the world, which is ridiculous. Those who own Airbnb, and I know them all, I mean, two owners in San Francisco, they make so much billions on the back of all of us that we need to share. And Uber is in the hands of Google and Amazon, and don't, they don't pay any taxes. And we are believed that we share. Ridiculous. Anyway, so our cities are ruined by preconceived ideas, fake ideas about sharing. And then there is London, which is a city which is becoming almost like a Dubai of the future. And I think Tate, what Tate is trying to do is to create this open space, to create this urban plaza, to create a public space, a form of publicness in a city which is becoming more and more privatized. So Berlin has still... Ooh, still a little chance to learn from these mistakes of big cities. Is Berlin going to make it? I don't know. Luckily, Airbnb is now cool. You know that Germany is the biggest enemy of Google, which I think is very good. <laughs> Berlin has forbidden Uber, which I think is very, very good. And two of the new shops of Louis Vuitton in Berlin have closed which I think is very good. <laughs> so, Berlin has a promise for the future, right? And it's still, it's still incredibly uh, cheap to live there. All artists are moving to Brussels or Berlin, I mean, because of the fact that you can still, it has still a quality of life. Anyway, but what's more important for me is to be able to change from one ritual, which I adore, and I'm sure I will get back to it at some point, which is the medium of exhibition, and I want to change, given what I feel in the world, to the ritual of theatre. And because I'm also in charge of Tempelhof, refugee city, I feel there are certain urgencies in the world which have to be addressed. They need to be addressed. And maybe, I don't know, I learned tricks how to deal with it. Maybe yes, maybe no. And we will definitely make mistakes. But I want to give myself the chance to work with a team of people to do something which I think is a ritual for today. And the Volksbühne has been there for 100 years. It was invented by Max Reinhardt, then Piscator, then it was taken over by Bertolt Brecht, by Hanne Müller. These giants of German literature, I feel very humbled to be asked to work for them. And I would like to invent a new ritual. We'll see where it gets us. I know in any case that the Syrians in refugee city in Temple of they are damn good cooks and they are very good dancers. <laughs> and can I just add something uh, in the more general sense of your question uh, and uh, from the perspective of uh, working within the cultural domain, the cultural field, I think this kind of like multiplicity of identities and the uh, cross-pollination of thinking and ideas is what is important here in, the, in this particular case. It doesn't mean that you are uh, being a curator or being a museum director is just a, an ephemeral kind of like notion or a kind of like a, a, a small type of notion. As a curator, you, or, and I'm sure it's the same for many other disciplines and for many other practitioners, I'm constantly encountering anthropological material. I'm looking into the development of societies. I'm looking into history. I'm looking into politics, 
finances plays a, a massive part in my, in, in, in my everyday life. The, the development of economic structures, the collapse of structures. So uh, we are constantly facing all these kind of um, aspects and we are constantly evolving through this. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it will be paradox or even contradictory for to, 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 to remain within something very specific or to kind of amplify something which can be very specific and very limiting in the long term. Therefore, the kind of thereby of the regime of visual art is incredibly fascinating. It's incredibly thick and at the same time very liquid. It eats so much stuff, yeah. it, it condenses so much stuff. A photograph here or a painting over there from the 40s, 50s. It's, it's, it's a kind of liquid thickness where so many things can be done. The only problem with visual arts today is that the visual arts work only function with a distance. That, that's the whole idea, to take a distance, yeah? literally, figuratively. And I think what we have to do right now is test out other disciplines which, which are dealing without the distance. Because maybe the distance is becoming an ultimate product of luxury which we might have to forget for a little while. And that's the reason why so many artists are interested in this whole idea of the performative in a way. And that I find very, it's a battle for many artists. I mean, when you speak to uh, this woman who reinvent abstraction and painting, I mean, they are dealing with these issues as well. Because abstraction today is something else than before. It's a form of performance. So it's, it's all these notions are incredibly interesting. Exactly. But there was a question here on the second row. It's fascinating by Tate Modern and by the whole area around because I think the whole of South Bank is a fascinating place full of so many things that goes in the direction that you have been so eloquently described about this change, this new approach which is rediscovering also probably more simplicity in the approach getting rid of all other intellectual abstraction and going to back to, to the search for some public space where to, to have a dialogue. But given the fact that, that see, if this is the, the, uh, the, the direction and I fully support it, I'm really uh, I'm fascinated by it, why you have to change such an iconic place and to re, uh, re rediscover somehow a square, an agora, uh, uh, changing the, 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 the structure, the nature of this South Bank area, which is already in itself uh, uh, much more lively and go, uh, going well beyond uh, this traditional notion of art and the museum and having something more lively, more articulated, more pluralistic. I'm really a little bit scared about this uh, further transformation of Tate Modern because uh, probably I'm probably a little bit conservative, but mm -hmm. I, I admire it as it was till now. I don't know in the future if you are going to rediscover a square to be put uh, in the back uh, of this old turbine uh, place. Well, what will be the, the real change? The, the, it's a very interesting question. The members and the this and the that and the Euro visitors. So the museum is a, is, is a mass audience. So we feel that we have to create a place where the mass audience can really enjoy themselves, engage with themselves, enjoy art in a very qualitative way. Much more quality than the city of London because the city of London, as you know, is congested. It's dense. It's expensive. And one of the successes of Tate is this whole idea of free access. Mm -hmm. And the architects, when they designed Tate, they did something very weird in 1996. Instead of making a door with staircases, mm -hmm. what did they do? They were digging in. And they created mm -hmm. a museum where in standing, instead of going up, you, you had to go down. Yeah. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. The people in Tate, the little kids, they love Tate because they are running down. The idea of the architects was creating movement. And the movement will be even more present in the new Tate with bridges, almost like a Piranesi style. But suddenly you will have rooms in Tate 
where you don't have Wi-Fi reception, <laughs> and you will have rooms in Tate where there is perfect silence. In order to know again what immobility is, what silence is, what tranquility, meditation is, we want to create this contrast. We want to create this collision of different experiences in a free space, in a public space, to create a form from civicness, like the civicness of Venezia, which Venezia was once, and you know that Venezia is the city for urbanists, which was one of the greatest inspiration. And so maybe Tate Modern with the Thames will become the new Venice. Voilà. <laughs> Uh, I am an architect and uh, I worked on a museum with Herzog and Demeron in Switzerland. So I would like to ask about uh, the context of a museum for a very few percentage of the population. And it's very interesting that you mentioned Uber and um, uh, Airbnb and those other things. So I'm curious to see your vision and point about how the museum in the future would transform in our, let's say, information age or the fourth industrial revolution as well. So the way, the way it would be more accessible other than just taking myself or uh, the family and just going there. So the museum, the museum uh, like the ones we know in for instance, in London, Tate Modern is a mass medium, but we still have to write the rules and laws for this new mass medium. And architects are still trying to come up with a new typology. And I think the new typologies are very interesting. Because uh, you're an architect, so we're going to a little yes. bit to talk about architecture. Yes, the whole idea of um, this monolith, the museum as a monolith, I think that's well past. The big buildings, I think the whole conception of the Louvre, is completely the past. It is not necessary, it's a waste of money and space. Yeah. Uh, I hope the Guggenheim will never be built, and it's probably not going to be built, the latest news is saying. It's not necessary. But what is necessary is the Sharjah, a different type of museums with the pavilions, creating a city in the city. Darat al Fanun is creating a city of memory. All these buildings are speaking about the history of this city, of this different layering of cities. And what you do is you keep walking staircases. You see all these stories which are layered as well. So what we have to learn as architects, and I say we, we worked in architecture both as well as any, we have to learn to really think about a new form of typology. But we depend on commissioners and on clients. So one of the ideas of Cole House was to create a summer school for clients. Because what we have to do is to teach clients, to think politicians, commissioners, to think in a new way, both private people and public instances. We have to write, we have to completely rethink what the museum in the future is going to be. And the competition in Helsinki of the new Guggenheim was typical. I mean, all the proposals which we saw, also the proposals for the new Bauhaus in Dessau and both the Bauhaus Archive in Berlin, these proposals by young architects are talking about a horizontal museum, different pavilions, which can interlock, which can change all the time from function, light and dark, that we can, can become libraries and something else. So we have to be very ambitious and very courageous, and that's because the tectonics is not enough. Just to add to, um, because you used two examples, Airbnb, you also use the same examples, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, uh, Uber. And these are two kind of like systems, I mean Airbnb and Uber are, without being a, a, a company, are the biggest companies of the world at the moment. And they are based on kind of like, uh, they are virtual companies. And it's quite interesting to mention the fact that uh, at Tate we are also looking or uh, approaching uh, the Tate website as a fifth site. And the, the entire collection is actually online and can be accessed. And additional material is presented online, which provides new ways of accessing all the elements that the, co that the collection aims to present. Cloud or something, because you can imagine how many millions around the world would love to visit it, but of course. just they, they can't. But, but we do provide this digital access, but yeah. I can tell you one thing which we learned from our colleagues also in the Metropolitan Museum, that the, the more success you have, 
digitally speaking, and the Metropolitan is the most successful museum in the world, digitally speaking, it influenced Interlock, and that's quite fascinating. And it does not make sense to say, I don't want this. Yeah. I mean, we have to work on both sides, and that's incredible. Without the Google Art Institute, okay? <laughs> We have to be independent from the Google art. Exactly. Th thinking the post-internet moment where we are at and the kind of like ex extensive and intense, intense moment of um, mediaization of ourselves and our own existence throughout, you know, the physical and virtual, then this is kind of becomes, um, you know, something that will, again provides a new platform, a new shape for forms that will develop, yeah. including art forms and art experiences alike. So two more questions. Is that okay? Two more and that's it. That uh, Western Europe and uh, America will not uh, be as uh, influential where all these uh, wonderful ideas, all this intellectual conversation, all the money uh, that's being spent on art is coming uh, from your end. And, and the rest of the world, you know, the, the, the rich are busy uh, building monuments and the poor uh, I've got no, no, uh, no time to fend for themselves and the rest are fighting each other. So what makes you so optimistic that um, uh, the future is going to come, the uh, future of the museums is going to be defined from um, regions that are outside the Western world? I'm optimistic yeah. because I'm a realist. And realism is accepting that these things take a lot, a lot of time. And I'm also optimistic because we cannot speak today anymore about centers and margins or center and peripheries. What's play being played out in Jordan and the example of Jordan is not about Jordan, is not even about the Middle East, it's about the whole world. What's happening today in Jordan is going to influence immediately legislation somewhere else in the world. So we are all not condemned, but we are all interlocked. And that makes me incredibly optimistic. But what we have to learn is to reinvent not politics, but what politics is. And in, in German you say gute Verwaltung, in English you say good governance. What is good governance? And that's incredibly important. And you know what? We are condemned to work together. Yes, we are condemned to work together. So I'm an optimist, yes, because I have time. People who don't have time, they are bitter. I feel, uh, just, to, just to, add, to, to answer your question as well, uh, for me it was a kind of like a very exceptional experience being here for uh, a, a couple of really important reasons and that's, uh, and the reason that the, the optimism is, 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 uh, is, is something that's kind of like driving uh, my thinking at the moment, particularly here, is the, you feel that you actually have a choice and you, you have a choice because what you do will affect things and what you, you will do will really produce the future. And that's something which is at a space where uh, in an urban and temporary reality, which is the here and now at the moment, you can experience from conditions that range from uh, religious war to financial collapse, but also to artistic practice, all this kind of like compression and at the same time, uh, intensity of experience, it gives me a choice because I can actually do something about that rather than, rather than read about it in books as it happened up until now. I'm really glad that you're here. I'm very glad about the, uh, I'm very happy that the subject talks about deconstruction of these norms and notions, whether of museums, cities, or anything, but we talk about museums tonight. And I'm glad that you're here in Amman because I'm not, I, I believe it's a place where you can that can hold a space for such deconstruction, whether it comes to identity, to architecture, art, politics, all of these things. There's so much to learn and look at, so I'm very happy that you're so, here. So what is your question? My question is Sharja, 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 and I wonder why you mentioned it so many times. Um, I, I stayed in Sharja for a few months, and honestly, I, I was maybe in a different mindset. I didn't have the chance to go see the museums. Maybe I have my preconceptions about the Gulf and about Chagra. And um, I, I would see the titles and all of these things, but now I'm wondering, like, did I make a mistake? Should I have come to that? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. we, can, we can only learn by, by doing, yeah. and we can only learn by 
by going to see for ourselves. Can you tell us, like, at least a hint why should we look at Sharjah? We should, we, we should look at this, this the, I mean, you're an architect, you should look at what Sharjah is trying to come up with in terms of horizontal architecture, is to create a form of urbs and civicness within that city. Mm -hmm. And it will take time, because today, uh, you know, Nora Akawi, yeah. who is based in New York and in Amman, yes. and working with the Columbia Centers, the, what she and they are doing in terms of looking into the future <coughs> of cultural centers and cultural spaces is incredibly worthwhile. And please go to the next biennial of Venice. Alejandro, uh, Alejandro Avareno, uh, he will, I think, present new types of cultural institutions by new collectives, by architects, which are wonderful to look at, not because they are beautiful, but they have new ideas. Okay. And it's also because architects finally learned to be a little bit more humble. Mm -hmm. Even Kohlhaas and mm -hmm. even Herz of the Maybe okay. not Zaha did. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>